So the final unknown project, unknown two in this case, has a different timeline typically based on how much time we have left at the end of the semester. Now, depending on when you start and what your sections are, we have kind of a simple breakdown based on the syllabus schedule. Usually the very first session is dedicated to talk about what it's about, how it works, more or less just the general ideas associated with it. However, right after that, the next session we get to meet, now we actually give you your unknown. Usually this will be in person. We would provide you with an actual sample that you'd have to keep in baby and take care of for a little while to make sure you have your experiments are uh, nice and organized and neat and clean and safe, basically. But in the remote conditions, we don't provide that to you. We just provide you with the actual unknown number that will be identified with it. And then soon after that, you actually get to start off with your very first primary tests, which are the gram stain and the um, reactive oxygen species tests. And then after that, you get to go on and start working on your flow chart so you can submit it by the next session. And then all the sessions that follow after that, these may be three, four weeks, depending on uh, the semester. Then you'll be solving that flow chart to identify what is your unknown that we assign to you. So what happens is once you're done with the kind of heavy lifting at the beginning, the end of the, uh, the semester itself is dedicated to you kind of working on your own to identify your unknown. That's pretty much the overall summary. So what is it? And let's kind of put it together based on what is already present in your lab supplement. This information is always there. So the last set of uh, deck slides that are present in the lab supplement has all of this information spelled out and I'm actually gonna provide it with a quick summary. So as always, we try and give you the overall purpose behind this, why do we do this? And this is kind of to mimic this idea of clinical diagnosis, this concept of, well, how do we know how to treat somebody in the event that we don't know what they have, what's ailing them. And as we will learn in lecture through epidemiology and pathology later on, the key idea here is, well, before we decide what to give you, like we learn in their control of microorganisms, we need to know what is hurting you first. And that's the part or the field of diagnosis. And so we typically talk about an entire set of terminology called etiology. And that kind of refers to the cause of a disease. And in our field, we're not talking about diabetes or heart attacks. We're really talking about specifically pathogens. And so we follow Koch's postulates when we talked about this on the very, very first uh, day of the course, when we talked about the importance of microbiology. We talked about Robert Koch and his postulates, these four to sometimes six steps on how do we confirm the identity of a particular organism. And so this is what we do in everyday labs nowadays. Every single time you go in and somebody takes a urine sample, a fecal sample, a blood sample, whatever, something, a little endoscopy thing going on, that's what they're doing. They're taking a little sample so they can test it, run the battery of tests that we learned in microbiology to identify what could be ailing you. So labs 19 through 38, for example, all those metabolic assays, they run them too. And so they run them one by one to see what type of organism is hurting you. So they set up a series of tests. And the idea then is once they confirm the positives, the negatives, and so on and so forth, then we come up with the identification of that pathogen. Now, those tests are typically not random. There's usually a set of rules behind that. And anytime we're suspecting, uh, suspecting something that is uh, bacterial, uh, we always will start off with a gram stain, just to double check. And we will always confirm that gram stain with a reactive oxygen species test too. And so after that, then we go through all those metabolic assays that we talked about before. Do they turn green? Do they turn red? Do they turn liquid? Uh, do they die? Do they live? That's what we end up doing. Now, again, this is not random. This is actually performed with a specific strategy in order to identify them. And they're based on two key things. One, typically the urgency of the patient's uh, ailments. So the idea is we don't want to take six days when the person might be dead in the next day, right? So there is a sense of urgency. So there's always a timeline associated with that, and we have to stick to it. And then the second one also has to do with money. The idea is we can't just randomly perform a million tests at the same time be a little bit wasteful and probably just not get the right results that we need. Sometimes we can even get false positives and false negatives. So we kind of combine this idea of what can we use and when can we use it to design a good pathway. And so that's what's usually done in real laboratories today. However, we're gonna mimic that condi uh, condition in our second unknown 
by doing the same thing. We're going to give you a time limit. We're going to give you a little bit of a money limit and the idea that certain tests cannot be performed under uh, strict conditions. And we're going to let you identify what is ailing our patient. And that's where we give you an unknown sample. In a face-to-face uh, -face lab, you'd actually get an actual sample here. In a remote lab, we'll give you a, remote, uh, a number that you'll have to kind of follow through a series of tests. And that uh, series of tests comes from your flow chart. Okay, so that's the plan. That's what we're going to do. So where do you get all your information aside from typically your instructor? The main source, as I mentioned before, is your lab supplement, right? So that's always present on Canvas since day one. And so the last set of slides uh, in that deck include all the material for the unknown. And so there's already a video present on YouTube for that. So make sure you review that too. But within the lab supplement, I'm going to give you a quick summary in a moment, has all the basic instructions, all the good recommendations, frequently asked questions, and I have tons and tons of examples present there too. And then lastly, usually we always end up having some practice rounds to make sure that everybody is familiar with the key kind of easy to forget rules of creating a good flowchart. Then as I mentioned before, there's videos for this. And then lastly, on Canvas, in the last module typically, we have uh, all the documentation that you need. So this includes the instructions, even this set of materials that I'm providing you here, uh, all the uh, handouts, all the report systems, and even the types of results that we always use in previous labs. So pretty pictures, pretty images, um, so you can actually detect or identify or assess a particular type of result. So that's the overall uh, set of resources. So make sure you have access to all of them. Now, to remind you, even from the lab supplement, the second unknown is kind of like a final exam. It's meant to be done alone. It's meant for you to prove your worth on everything you've learned so far. And so the idea is you're supposed to already know everything you've gone through, and you should be able to demonstrate it. Now, here's the point is like a diagnosis in real life is you have access to all your materials. So you should be able to use your book, your lab manual, everything else. And your job is to figure out what's wrong with somebody. Right, so here is you still have access to all those documentations that I just showed in the previous slide, and you get to figure out what's your unknown. That's the plan. The only difference, though, is you're not allowed, kind of like an exam, not to ask anybody else. That includes your faculty members. Right, the idea is you can ask them about protocols and things like that, but you don't get to ask, hey, what does this look like to you? Is this green? Is this positive? That's part of your decision. You take that responsibility of providing those right answers. So uh, if it's part of the process of protocol, obviously talk to your instructor, no problems there. But aside from that, you're kind of on your own. You're meant to uh, be able to identify this like a final exam. Okay, so rely on your supplement, your manual, your notebooks, your own results from your lab reports, and obviously YouTube too. So this is all on you. Now, what happens for those of you who might remember at the beginning of the course, we always talk about the open schedule. Typically, because we now want you to be able to perform all your tests in whatever order you can and you, for you to be efficient, again, we're talking about urgency here too, all the lab sections become available to you. So that means every lab section, every single lab time, morning, afternoon, and evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and we typically also offer uh, Friday mornings or Friday early afternoon sessions for people to access them, those become available to you. So this becomes an open lab system meaning then you can come in at any point in time to set up your tests, all right? Now, uh, the first two sessions though, those are the ones where we cover this material that we're going over right now. So they're kind of a little bit intense, right? The idea is you have to come in, you have to make sure you finish your gram stain, your reactive oxygen species, you make sure you finish your, uh, you get your bug list, your flow chart, all of that gets very, very, very heavy. But then after that, then again, it becomes that open schedule that I'm talking about uh, currently. So that means there's no more fixed lab sessions anymore, rather the whole system, all the sections, all the instructors come available to you at this point in time. Now, rather than going through the lab supplement that I've already gone through in the previous video to this guy, uh, again, make sure you watch it, make sure you work with the lab supplement and all that information will be available in some sort of quiz format for you guys to test right before you start this whole thing. So we always wanna make sure you're ready to do this, right? Now, in terms of the lab supplement itself, I've kind of broken it down into like a table of contents, if you will, of all the slides that are in there after uh, the very first slide that says the second unknown. So here we have, for example, the same thing that I covered earlier, 
an intro, but I also talk about how the grading system works. So I'll leave it for that for you guys to go over there. Um, an overall on overview of how the schedule also works and how we enter this kind of second phase of open labs, all the forms that you're going to be using. So you're going to be typing in or writing in. Typically, we do this handwritten, though, um, your Gramstein reports, your RRS reports, and so on and so forth, and your final unknown report, which is usually the one that is typed. And then uh, there is availability of digital forms of those two, um, making sure that we establish what you're using to obtain your information, which is Berge's manual. And so that's what is obtained typically from the uh, library for about a two hour checkout. That is allowed to be used uh, with company if you want to, so you guys can work together on those just to make sure you get the right uh, pluses, minuses, variables, et cetera. And then uh, I showed you a few little samples of them and how to read them and what goes in there. So use that page in there as a quick sample. Then uh, we provide you with an example of what it's like to fill the matrix itself. And I'll give you an example a little bit more today. And then really the big focus, the big heavy hitter in the next few slides in there are how to craft your flowchart. And not only in terms of the rules, policies, regulations, call it whatever, there's a lot of them. And since it's worth about half of the points of the actual uh, protocol itself or the actual test, then it's really important that you spend all this time here following every single little detail in here. And so I provide you with a couple of checklists. There's one checklist uh, towards the beginning of that portion, and then there's another checklist at the end. And then I also include a list of common uh, point loss uh, things that occur to students that they miss silly little things that again, little by little, they start chipping off at your grade. So I really have kind of built a series of slides all dedicating to ensure you have the best, most amazing, bestest, foreverest kind of uh, flowchart that I want you to have. So 50 points, even after losing two or three points, you know, it'll bring you down to 90% you know, 80%. And so you can see that quickly starts going down, right? And then at the end of that, once I give you the second checklist, again, to make sure that everybody is on par, then right after that, I have a about 10 to 12 different examples, not only my own, I provide you a little bit of a template first, but then I also give you previous examples of students that have approved for me to post their stuff. These are students that got at least a 45 out of 50, or in this case, 90% or higher on their flowcharts. They may not necessarily be perfect, but they were damn good enough to be included in, uh, in our lab supplement and give you an idea how to craft those. The idea here is that way you have something to base on how to craft yours. You'll notice their examples are always top to bottom, pluses are on the left, minuses are on the right kind of thing, making sure that some of them are color labeled, making sure that... Uh, your variables are always placed on both uh, sides. All those rules that we always tell you, these ones are the best examples I can give you. So make sure you kind of use those as a good uh, place to start. And then after that, typically we end up going through a little bit of a session of practicing flowcharts. And so those are three examples that I provided you at the end. So I'm going to kind of add that over here really quick, just kind of as an example, not really to record it. But the idea then is, let's see if I can get my, there it goes, uh, pen, is that you'll get three examples that I provide you, one of them being kind of a little bit of a silly example based on animals rather than actual um, organisms. And we do some little kind of barnyard tests. There it goes. And the idea is for you to start crafting a very, very simple kind of five name uh, flow chart and break them down into ways that you can separate out the animals into their individual categories and showing you that you can do this in multiple ways. And that's one of those things that we always try to establish. There are multiple ways to solve this uh, each flow chart. And that variety, these variables, for example, uh, this variety, I should say, I shouldn't call them variables is what lets everybody be a little bit more unique, lets everybody be more efficient in their time. So all of this is kind of available to you. Then we actually provide you with your very first real example, actually using uh, a series of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. So, and your job then is to use certain metabolic tests that you've done before, and then start planning out another one, same idea, right? 
But the difference here is now to emphasize timing, to make sure you understand that as you uh, build these specific uh, flowcharts, now you know where do you want to choose your tests and why to produce a, a better uh, efficient flowchart. And the very last one is a actually complex example. Here we have our last one that now actually forces you kind of to use the variables as a way to ensure that you know that anytime you have a variable in a flowchart, so obviously you see I'm not writing any numbers, but when you have something that is a flowchart, you always kind of identify it saying, hey, this guy's a variable for this particular test. So that same organism must always be labeled on both sides of the test since you don't know what its result is going to be, right? So here you'll always say, hey, this guy's a variable here, this guy's a variable here, and it's always placed on both sides. And then you actually quickly get to find out also that that leads to a certain type of efficiency on how to craft your uh, flow charts a little bit better. So that's what we get to do during our first couple of sessions for everybody's practice. So now, typically, just to kind of remind you what we're doing over here, we also want to emphasize um, what we're going on in case that there's schedule changes. They do happen quite often. So the idea is typically when we start off our next session, let me kind of switch my pointer over here. Here we have, this is when we assign your unknown or your slant. That's the same day you get to start your gram stain and your reactive oxygen species confirmatory test. And then once you're done with those, then you can request your bug list. And at that point in time, that becomes your own time to go and research uh, Berge's manual through the library, complete your matrix. And then typically by the next session, or at least 48 hours, depending if it's something connected to a weekend, um, then that's when your flowchart will be due. That's the big plan right now. So let's go through a quick set of kind of step-by-step -step instructions here. Um, and to ensure that there is documents, there are documents, I should say, that are uh, available to you that you should follow. The very first one is the second document available in the unknown module, which is a color coded document that is built up into little tables. They give you uh, in the columns, basically what you do, depending on your situation and in the rows, each step by step of what to perform. So what I'm going to do now is basically break down that table that you have in uh, 3.01, uh, the second document, so it's B in this case, and go through each one of the steps really quick, and then we'll stop there for some questions. So the first one is what do you get to do on the very first day? And so that means you're going to obtain your unknown number, so you have to come over and request that from me, saying, hey, I would like to start my unknown, please provide me with my unknown slant or my unknown sample. So here we would give you your actual unknown number. So that typically happens on the second session. At that point in time, you're supposed to start your first, very first test that everybody does, which is again in bacteriology, that's the gram stain. And so your first step is basically 10 minutes long and that's time. So everybody has to fit within that time limit. Now, within that first, uh, sorry, second session of your lab, then you're gonna have for a remote condition, the entire lab to start it. You don't get all three hours to do this, but you have all three hours to start that 10 minute timer. So we wanna make sure that you are truly ready to do that before you get that timer on your shoulders. So you can start immediately right off the bat if you feel prepared, or you can go to the back and kind of read it a little bit more, make sure you're, you're in the right headspace before you get that timer going up. And so typically once you're ready, you're gonna say, hey, I'm ready to go. And believe it or not, just to make sure, I will confirm with you that you're ready as well. So I'm actually going to ask you, hey, did you read this document? Are you ready to go? And so once those two uh, agree, the instructor and the student, then the 10 minute timer starts. So it won't be just kind of random of, haha, get, you know, you're on a timer yet. We want to make sure you're ready. I'm going to ask to make sure you're ready. And then the timer will start. Okay. At that point in time, we will give you the data for the gram stain that you need to uh, figure out. Right? Just like you've done before, we give you some images, we give you some information, and you have to assess it. And so your job is to analyze that data to determine what its gram designation is and its morphology, meaning do you need to know if it's gram positive or gram negative, and you need to tell me its shape, right? its arrangement. All of those become uh, things you actually need to do. And then after that, once you figure out what it is, then you write down on your first quarter sheet. Again, this is all available in the lab supplement. 
on Canvas, but I have a little example of it right here. It looks bigger typically because it's just on a screen, but normally these guys are about a quarter of a page uh, in width and in height. So therefore that's why you see it uh, called a quarter sheet. So the first one is called the Gramstein report. And so you normally fill this out with your uh, laboratory uh, course. So there's a 102, there's a 100, there's a 150. Obviously you wanna fill out your respective section and then typically include here your full name. I know it says just last name. Sometimes those repeat. So we wanna make sure we know who you are. You, specifically your unknown number. And then here you get to report whether it's gram positive or gram negative. Um, and then here you get to report uh, its shape, right? If it's uh, streptococcus, it's a uh, bacillus and so on and so forth, those go there. And so this is what you turn into your instructor in person or digitally. It's typically written, not typed, right? If it's digital, you wanna submit this as a PDF. And then your instructor will typically get graded within just a couple of minutes tops up to 10 points. Each of the two answers you're including in here is worth five points for a grand total of 10 points. Now, here's the thing is that these points are final. Um, so for example, let's say your organism was gram negative and you said gram positive. Well, here you'd lose your five points and you'd get five out of 10 instead of 10 out of 10. Now, since we've marked it wrong, then you by now you know exactly what the uh, gram designation for your organism is so you don't have to figure it out again. Now, once those 10 minutes are done, then you immediately proceed to the next kind of intense step, which is gonna be your confirmation test. Typically, we don't just trust the one gram stain, we actually have to do a second test to make sure you're right about your gram stain. And so that's your ROS test or your reactive oxygen species test. And so at that point in time, a second timer kicks in for five minutes. And at that point in time, so we grade your gram stain, and within that same second session, you start your ROS test. So once you respond there again, another uh, five minute timer starts here. And now we'll again send you another set of data with information about an ROS test. And now you, here's where it gets a little bit more uh, specific. You have to figure out which test you're gonna perform because we can't just give you any test. The gram stains can be confirmed using different tests. And so gram positives require a couple of tests, gram negatives require a different set of tests. So your job here is to make sure you know which one to use. And you will only know that because of the fact that you've performed the last series of labs that you had to do that were uh, the metabolic assays. And in those, you performed ROS tests that allowed you to confirm gram positives versus gram negatives. So you have to figure that one out on your own. And so once you figure out which test to perform, then you're gonna be able to tell me on your other quarter sheet, which test you're requesting to do. So you can say, hey, I wanna perform this one versus that one. And then you're gonna tell me what type of result you expect from that test. And so based on the test you perform and the result you expect, that will confirm whether your organism was actually gram positive or gram negative, right? So the same rules apply. You have a quarter sheet, you have now five minutes to return that and that will be worth five points, 2.5 uh, points for each of those two answers. Once you get those two steps out of the way, the 10 minute, the five minutes, so a grand total of 15 minutes, then you'll be allowed to request that list of organisms that are gonna be the possibilities for your, uh, for your unknown. So that's the overall uh, intense day that you're starting your first 15 minutes, either present in the lab or typically digitally, uh, you can do these within a 15 minute time frame, making sure that everybody is coordinated for this, right? So then after that, then you can request your bug list, the infamous bug list that contains all the possibilities of your organisms. So now here we have a, just a random bug list that is not even complete. I just kind of made it up um, in which we will give you a bug list number. So make sure you don't forget that one and then a non-alphabetized list of all the possibilities that your unknown could be. And so you get to take that list and go to the library and research using only this specific edition, only the specific book, only the specific text, only the specific materials. So I'm emphasizing that many times, right? This will be your only source of information for this particular bug list. So go work on that. And then you'll start inputting that alphabetically by genus, so you notice that I have it on here, onto your matrix, right? So again, don't research this off of anywhere else. You can't use Google, you can't use Wikipedia. 
don't use any of those because they will give you conflicting results with uh, Berge's manual. So don't do that. So then your job is to take that wonderful 11 by 18 sheet that we gave you, right? So we provided you either through your kit or you can pick it up from the lab itself and you will input all that information that you had from your uh, Berge's manual and complete and very, very almost complete or almost full, if not full matrix. Like I said before, especially if you read the lab supplement, this guy should be about 95 to 100% complete. Sometimes there may be one or two results out of here that may be missing in Berge's manual, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It does happen. But nobody should have large chunks of these missing at all, right? So um, the situation in which one or two organisms may be missing one or two little squares in here is about a one in 50 shot. And usually there's a couple of hundred of you guys, which then that means it might happen to one or two of you, three of you maybe at best. So it's very unlikely that you'll be that person. So if you are missing lots of squares in here, you really want to go back to Berge's and search more thoroughly. Trust me, the information is there. Okay. So copy onto your matrix, make sure you alpha, alphabetize it by the genera, so by the genus. And then at that point in time, you'll have until your next session to uh, construct your flow chart. Now keep this in mind though, the uh, next session applies to typically uh, the two day session. So that means that if you're starting off somewhere in the middle of the week, that means it's the next session. If you're starting at the end of the week, that literally means 48 hours though. So that means you'll have a couple of days to work on it and submit it. So don't assume that you have four or five days to do so either. So make sure you're following that along and whatever information your instructor tells you to follow, okay? So what happens then? Once you have your awesome flowchart built up, right? You can submit that for grading. And so again, before you submit it, make sure you follow all those pages in the lab supplement, those checklists, those FAQs, Make sure you're checking for those common mistakes. You really don't want to get yourself into a situation of regrades. But if you're going to start getting regrades, this is when we get to emphasize if we're doing this digitally, depending on your session, uh, you're going to be submitting everything typically through, uh, through an email as opposed to in person. And so make sure the couple of uh, common mistakes that will happen, you don't want to lose out on your grading, is make sure you're using your email. And what I mean by that is your school email not a proxy email, not a Gmail, not a Hotmail account, that kind of thing. You're not even supposed to be using Canvas. Why? Because we're going to be receiving hundreds and hundreds of these in a very, very small amount of time. And we want to make sure we focus on you. And so that means we typically update our filters on our emails to ensure that we don't let anything else in aside from school emails only. So if you end up using some sort of proxy or linking it somewhere else, your email probably won't come through, okay? The other thing is that happens is since you're gonna be submitting PDF files all the time, make sure you're actually attaching the file into the body of the email, not a link to the file itself. Google Docs are known infamously for doing that, right? And you won't be using Google Docs, but I'm just giving you the heads up, is that rather than sending, go see my file over there, that's actually wasting time to your grader. So make sure the file is in the body, not the link to the body of the file. Okay, so keep that in mind. All the things you're going to be submitting should be in PDF format and make sure that both the PDF file itself, so the file name is correct, as well as the document title is correct. And so keep in mind, these are different things. So when you're creating a file on your computer, remember the file has a name, right? And so you need to make sure that it includes the information pertinent to that. But then inside your file, the actual document itself, then make sure it has all the critical things like your name, your unknown number, all that good stuff. Otherwise, we end up just sending it back to you saying, we don't know who this is, try again. Make sure that also everything is included in uh, the body of the email, like I said, specifically in landscape format, because the graders, including myself, we usually end up using tablets to make sure we can grade these things, right? And so what happens is I'm sure somebody's uh, received at some point in time a picture that hasn't been rotated and you have to turn your neck or kind of lock your phone into place to make sure you can grade it. The same thing applies to us. If we have to kind of tweak your file all over, the, all over the place, it makes it difficult to grade. So make sure that you're submitting the, uh, the email and in the body of the email, everything is landscape, but also kind of it should be access landscape too, 
So otherwise we will send it back to you saying, do it again, okay? And then make sure that if there's any regrades, you're naming your files as they go too. That way we know which one is which. Otherwise we'll get confused. And again, we'll send it back to you saying, which one is which? Again, wasting time, right? Now, at this point in time, once you submit it for grading, you're kind of just left to a little bit of a waiting period, right? We have to go through hundreds of these typically. And so even at a good five to 10 minute timer at this point in time, just 10, 20, 30 files, at that point in time, that turns into hours of grading. So that means you probably wanna be patient. So hang in there. Uh, I don't encourage you to send any email updates because that'll tag onto Outlook and put your email at the back of the list because it's brand new. And so it kind of resets you. So just hang in there, give us a, at least 48 hours before you decide to start um, being concerned about that. And at that point in time, we usually send updates to everybody saying, hey, we're almost done grading, hang in there, that kind of thing, all right? So once that is done, once you get your uh, grades done, two things will actually have to happen. Not only your point system will be put in there, but the word approved will actually appear on your flowchart. If the word approved doesn't uh, appear, that means you cannot start doing your set of tests. So make sure the word approved appears on it, okay? What does this mean? If you get approved, if you get a score, let's say 48 out of 50 or something like that, and the word approved appears on it, then a new uh, file will appear for you that will include a code for you to solve. That code basically is a series of steps, a series of numbers that correspond with another image compendium, just like you've had before, that allows you to solve the identity of your flowchart. Normally, you would be actually performing live tests in the lab, figuring out if it's positive, it's negative, did it grow, did it not grow, and so on and so forth. Here, you're going to do the same thing, but just using images, at least for the digital version of this. So you're going to use that code to solve for those results. Once you have that code, you can go through you know, the pages on the slide deck of that compendium and then figure out, oh, my organism is doing this test and I'm getting this type of result. Once you have that all put together, then you should be able to figure out what your unknown number uh, identity is. And then you can write your report just like it's posted in the portal and all the instructions are there. So that's the overall idea of our second unknown. All you have to do is again, make sure you read the lab supplement, watch these videos and follow these key you know, six steps or so, and you should be good to go.